Hello. Hello. Nice to see you all. You braved the elements. I, I told Jan Ludovic that the heavens had opened to welcome him to Santa Barbara, where normally we're always sunny and always warm, and suddenly we're not. But it's been quite dramatic and appropriate since this lecture promises to be very dramatic as well. Um, yeah, I know you know who I am already, but uh, just to remind people, my name's Ike Kang. I'm deputy director and chief curator here at the museum. Do we want to fix the? Oh, no, you're just you're touching the screen. Oh. oh. Let's go back and get to the beginning. How did I do that? My piece of paper did that. Okay. Sorry about that small technical difficulty. Um, and we're so proud to be able to welcome Jan, Jan Ludovic Gutierrez from the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, where he serves as curator and head of the Department of the Arts of Africa and the Americas uh, since 2008. Uh, he has advanced degrees from the University of Louvain in Belgium, as well as from the University of Chicago, where he received his doctorate. He has curated many shows and published extensively, particularly in the area of traditional art of Central Africa, contemporary African and African diaspora art. And today, he's going to do us the great favor of giving us a sneak peek of an exhibition that he's guest curated at MIA, as it's now called. Um, and it's currently on view. It's uh, Egypt's Sunken Cities. And um, it really sounds like a very exciting uh, archaeological discovery of some 20 years ago now, but um, really untold treasures that he's about to share with us. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming here. And thank you to Ike Kang and Michelle West for inviting me. It's very exciting to be here. Also perfect timing. When I left Minneapolis yesterday, we had the first snowstorm. And the plane was delayed because it had to be de-iced. So no problems like that here. Um, Egypt is not my specialty, but I had six months to become an Egyptologist, so I will try to um, cover this very exciting exhibition that um, shows excavations done of over the last 20 years in northern Egypt on the Mediterranean coast, and these excavations are ongoing. So um, they are done by um, a French team of archaeologists working with Egyptians. And this show, Egypt's Sunken Cities, really tells three stories. One is about what's found on the water. So it's uh, a discovery of cities that had disappeared from the surface of the earth and that were rediscovered in the last 20 years. And the second theme, story of this show, tells the encounter of the ancient Egyptian civilization and the Greek culture. So it's really, we are here at the end of the Egyptian kingdom when the Greek dynasty of the Ptolemies ruled Egypt. But the encounter was also uh, found in, in rituals, and I will talk about uh, Osirian mysteries, and in the aesthetics of the artwork. And the third story of this exhibition focuses on one god in particular, namely Osiris and the Osirian mysteries. So um, this is the underwater archaeologist, Frank Godio, who has been doing work in uh, northern Egypt, but then also uh, around Cuba and in the Philippines. He's a specialist who finds uh, mainly shipwrecks and their treasures, but has been working for the last 20 years in Egypt. And just to situate uh, you the area, so you see the Nile, and then the Nile Delta, which is the, this green triangle on the Mediterranean coast, which has more or less the size of New Hampshire. And there are various branches of the Nile that end up in the um, Mediterranean. And so you see the city of Alexandria on the left, and then Rosetta, where the Rosetta stone was discovered. Um, and what we 
are talking about is just in between those two red dots. And um, that's to situate uh, the geography. But then historically, and this is kind of an overwhelming slide, but what I just want to point out, the green lines start in the upper left corner with the foundation of the Egyptian kingdom, and then end up here, which is modern Egypt. And the, the period that we, the exhibition really focuses on is this Ptolemaic period, when the Greek ruled over Egypt. A, a, a dynasty from Macedonia. Um, and, and then the end of the show starts with the Roman period. So we're really at the end of the ancient Egyptian kingdom, which was then followed uh, by the Byzantine period and then the um, Islamic um, civilization. So archaeologists and Egyptologists knew about three cities, Canopus, Thonis, and Heraklion, who, that had been mentioned in old sources, uh, both Egyptian sources and also Greek sources. The Greek historian Herodotus visited Egypt in the 5th century BCE, so before the Ptolemies uh, came to rule. Three cities were known, they had not been found on land, and that led the French and Egyptian arch underwater archaeologists to look for them under the sea. And they prepared for two years scanning the sea in a particular bay. Uh, I can maybe use the pointer. A bay here, this bay here, which is called Abukir. They scanned for over a year the surface of the sea bottom and um, started excavating and they found one city close, uh, not that far from the coast, about two miles, called Canopus. So there were still two more cities to look for. And um, as they continued their excavations, they found this object that was about five miles off the coast. And the water, you must imagine, is not that deep uh, in the Mediterranean along this uh, uh, Egyptian coast about 20 feet, but then most of the objects that were discovered were under another six, eight feet of sand, silt, and sometimes clay, so it really had to be dug out. And the first, one of the first objects they discovered in this second site was a, a shrine called a naos, which is a Greek word, but it's used to describe the sacred and secret center of any Egyptian temple. And the naos, um, one can still see the holes here and there uh, that would have had the hinges of two doors. And the doors would have been in wood covered with gold and they disintegrated, so they were not found. And inside the shrine would be the statue, a small statue of the god to whom the shrine and the temple was dedicated. Now, the chance the archaeologists had was that there were hieroglyphs on this side of the naos that, although eroded, were still legible. And uh, the hieroglyphs mentioned that this was the house of Amun. In other words, the temple dedicated to Amun, who's the upper god of the Egyptians. And from old written sources, uh, Egyptologists knew that there was a big temple of Amon in the city of Heraklion. So the conclusion was that they had discovered the big temple in the city of Heraklion. So one more city to go. And they, while they continued digging around that big temple, they found a beautiful steel with a royal decree dating from 380 BCE before Common Era, um, which is still the Egyptian period. This is pre-Ptolemaic. And the steel, which as you can see, is, uh, was, um, was holed out of the, the, the water using uh, 
extremely strong cranes because this is more than a ton. Um, the inscription on the steel uh, is so well preserved, as you can see, because it was found facing down, so the water had not uh, eroded it. And um, the beginning of the steel, it's read from right to left and from top to bottom, and the beginning tells about the king Nectanibo I, uh, what a wonderful king he was, how he built temples, and how he covered the temples in gold. And then the middle of the steel t talks about business, about uh, taxes that had to be in on all ships coming into Egypt and leaving Egypt. And there's a whole description of all the items that had to be taxed. Um, and then the steel continues to stipulate that 10% of all these taxes had to be given to a particular temple, the temple of the goddess Neet, who was the kind of the ruler of um, Lower Egypt. And we are here in Lower Egypt, where the, the Nile flows into the, uh, the sea. And then at the end of the steel, in the, in the, um, in the left columns, um, it is written that the steel has to be erected in the city of Thonis. And this was found next to the temple of Amun. In other words, the city of Heraklion was the same as the city of Thonis. It was one city which had two names, an old, an old Egyptian name, Thonis, and the new one given by the Greek Heraklion. So that was a major discovery that resolved um, a riddle that had um, preoccupied Egyptologists for a long time. So when and why did these two cities, the one of Canopus and the second one of Thonis Heraklion, disappear? Um, this region, especially in the past, um, was prone to earthquakes, followed by tsunamis and flooding, and there was also a, a geological or chemical uh, process that took place in the soil of these cities, namely called liqu lif liquefaction. In other words, the uh, change of solid state to liquid. And so we know that uh, from historical record and even from the sculptures that there were a number of catastrophes over the centuries. For instance, this uh, Ptolemaic couple of a king and a queen who were found on the water in Thomas Heraklion. But it was, um, and, and they are over six, um, six, 16 feet high. Um, it is, the archaeologists discovered that the queen had been repaired in the past by the ancient Egyptians. So apparently it had already fallen down and was re-erected in front of the temple. And so a, a series of catastrophes had destroyed parts of those cities. Canopus apparently disappeared um, for good just before Common Era, around the first or sec second century BCE. And then the city of Thonus Her Heraklion survived apparently till around 700, 750 of the Common Era and then also completely disappeared under, under water. Um, so we have the, the chance to... So let me first start by saying that this exhibition came from Europe. It started in Paris, traveled to the British Museum, then to Zurich, the Rietberg Museum, and then came to the US where it opened in St. Louis and now has its last venue, uh, probably last venue, in Minneapolis. It's a, a long, it has a long run. It will last till the middle of April. And we um, ha have the chance that our building allows us to put these colossi in the lobby of the museum, these two. And then the third colossus, here you have the precise dimensions, 17.7 feet and 13,000 pounds. The third colossus, which represents a god, we put on the second floor towards the entrance of the exhibition. So it's quite a dramatic setup that welcomes the visitor uh, to the show. And this particular colossus is of a god called Habi, 
um, who is uh, the god of the flooding of the Nile and therefore also of uh, fertility, since when the Nile floods the plains and the banks of the river and then recedes, it leaves behind black soil, which is uh, extremely fertile and uh, which allows farmers to grow the crops of the new agricultural cycle. And so this god is represented uh, in an androgynous fashion. Um, it has both a beard and breasts, so it's both male and female, uh, which is kind of a, a symbol of, of fertility for the ancient Egyptians. It uh, carries an offering table, which is also um, a sign of abundance, and so it stood probably, which it's back to the Mediterranean and facing the Nile that um, that was this artery of fertility for the country. I should also mention that the, our word Egypt comes from the Greek. It was a Greek, the, the name that the Greek gave to this kingdom. The original name that the ancient Egyptians used was Kemet, K-M-T, which means black soil or black community. So um, that is, of course, related to the Nile. Apart from uh, this spectacular uh, god, other deities were discovered underwater, um, including this uh, smaller representation and partial representation of the god Bess, who um, is, is a dwarf god, um, and he's uh, a protector of pregnant women and of children. In fact, he protected uh, the small child Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris, and I will tell more about that mytholo mythology in a minute. And um, he's um, extremely beautifully rendered in, in clay with these uh, heavy, bushy eyebrows. And then in his crown, there's a representation of a bull. And if, if you look, I don't know if it's visible from um, the auditorium, but the bull between the horns has a solar disk, and that's the Apis bull, which is a representation of Osiris. But the interesting thing is that um, God Bess here is brandishing a sword that is not an Egyptian sword, it's a Macedonian one. So it shows this merging of the Egyptian and Greek cultures. And the Greek took over many gods, uh, from the Egyptians and often renamed them, but not always. Um, talking about this fusion of uh, Egyptian and Greek, uh, this is a beautiful uh, sculptural example of that syn synthesis. Um, this statue, found in Canopus, represents a, a queen, Arsinoe II, who after her death was um, well, her husband dedicated a cult to her, and he made her, changed her into the goddess Aphrodite, or Hathor, for the Egyptians, who's the god of love, but also of seafarers and, 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 and the sea. And so, um, the, the, the sculpture, unfortunately, which is life-size, um, I didn't mention the dimensions, but it's life-size. Unfortunately, the head hasn't been discovered. But um, it is both Egyptian and Greek. The Egyptian uh, heritage is this left foot in front of the right, which is how Egyptian statues would be um, carved. And what you can't see, there's also a pillar in the back. And pillars were also characteristic for Egyptian sculptures. But in this case, the pillar is somewhat decentered and has also been wrapped by the sculpture in drapery. So there was a change. And then, of course, the, the wet draping and the rendering of the uh, body itself is extremely Greek. So, and we don't know whether this sculpture was made by a Greek artist or an Egyptian one. We know that the Ptolemies had Greek artists come to Egypt, but then also Egyptian artists are known to have carved in the style of the Greek during the Ptolemaic period, which is uh, from around the 4th century BCE to 
the 30s BCE. So uh, one of the masterpieces of the exhibition, um, the French underwater archaeologist Frank Goggio, who came to Minneapolis and gave a number of lectures, um, from which I benefited, of course, um, he pointed out that the Venus of Milo, which is at the Louvre, and of course Aphrodite is Venus for the Romans, the, Af the Venus of Milo, first of all, is one century younger, is from the second century BC, and secondly is carved in marble, which is an easier stone to carve than grand diorite in which this sculpture is made. So he claims that this Aphrodite is far superior to the Milo, the Venus uh, at the Louvre. As I mentioned, um, this, or maybe I, I failed to mention, this coastal area of Egypt, and especially the port cities of Canopus and Thonis Heraklion, were extremely cosmopolitan. They were there were exchanges not only with Greece but with other neighbors of Egypt. And so this is, um, it's very small, it's a part of a statue. Um, it, it represents a non-Egyptian god, a Phoenician god, maybe Baal. And it is carved in, this, in a style that is typical for the island of Cyprus, which is kind of halfway between Egypt and the eastern part of the Mediterranean. So we have this uh, Phoenician deity carved in the in a Cypriotic style found in Egypt, which shows you the the early global um, early globalization in this part of the Mediterranean. And the Egyptians were the ancient Egyptians were very open to uh, having immigrants open their own temples. So there was a, a flourishing of non-Egyptian temples in those cosmopolitan cities. This is, again, maybe not very, uh, maybe hard to read, but uh, a table that shows the equivalence or correspondence between some Egyptian gods and Greek counterparts. And as Herodotus mentioned himself, um, the nearly all the names of the, or many names of the Greek gods, gods came from Egypt. So there was an equivalence between um, uh, Zeus and Ammon, of course, but um, also between Osiris and Zeus and Dionysos. And then the Greek created a new god, and we will see his representation later on, called Serapis. And Serapis is the same god as Osiris, but he combines more characteristics of Greek gods. And so he appeared during the Ptolemaic uh, period and um, was venerated both by the Greek and the Egyptians as, as an Egyptian god. So let us then tell the story of Isis and Osiris. The exhibition also shows works of art that were not excavated by the underwater archaeologists, um, but that kind of enhanced the story of the exhibition. And this beautiful pair um, predates the Ptolemies and in fact is from the Seti dynasty in ancient Egypt, which is famous for its exquisite work in stone. And these are um, I would say about four feet high sculptures of a seated Isis and a seated Osiris. Um, the representation of Osiris, you can see he's completely covered in cloth. You can't see his toes. And that's because, in fact, he's the first mummy in the Egyptian mythology. And why was he a mummy? Because he had been killed by his brother. Um, Osiris had inherited the Nile Valley and his brother Seth had inherited the desert. And Seth was not happy with that. So he killed, he killed his brother, Osiris, and chopped him up in 14 pieces and scattered those 14 pieces over Egypt. <coughs> 
And so it's Osiris's wife, who also happens to be his sister, which was fairly common in ancient Egyptian mythology and also among the pharaohs. They would often marry uh, between siblings. So Isis would gather all the pieces of her husband and put them together and wrap them in uh, linen and creating the first mummy. And with her magic powers, she was able to resuscitate him. Um, and after his rebirth, uh, Osiris and Isis had just enough time to make a child called Horus. And then Osiris disappeared to the underworld and became the god of the, the departed, and the judge of the souls. But here he holds in his hands a hook and a flail, which uh, were signs of authority, uh, divine authority, and later pharaohs would also wear these, um, both in sculptures and in, in real life. So that's Osiris. Isis is, is uh, carved differently. You see more of her body. And she, in her right hand, has a sign which kind of consists of a circle with a cross underneath, which is the symbol of uh, the origin of life. It's called Ankh in ancient Egyptian. And um, often Isis or her personifications have this, this sign. And um, both have a crown. The crown of Osiris combines various um, well, it combines the crowns for Upper and Lower Egypt, that later the pharaohs would then also wear, whereas Isis has this solar disk uh, between two horns, which is a symbol that we see on the on bulls, but also here, and it kind of combines the nurturing aspect, Isis was called the mother of humanity, with her celestial aspect, namely the solar disk. Now, um, this is Horus. Um, I'm sorry for the, the format change of the uh, slides. Um, Horus, the child of Isis and Osiris, is um, represented in either of two guises. One as a young child, Horus the child, a naked boy, uh, often with a braid on one side of his head. Um, and uh, another guy would be the falcon, and Horus, uh, as a child, had to be protected from his uncle Seth, who, who was going to kill him. Um, he was protected, um, hidden in the marshes of the Nile Delta, and after he had uh, become an adult, Horus would avenge his father Osiris by killing Seth. And after having killed Seth, he Horus became the first pharaoh of Egypt, and he would then also protect all his successors. That's why you see uh, a little figure here between the legs of Horus the falcon, and that figure is a pharaoh. In fact, we know that that's Pharaoh Nectanebo II, who's the successor of the one who made that decree that you saw on the steel. And uh, the uh, the object on the left is a, is a beautiful steel with a basin. Um, it's a magic steel, so a priest would pour water over Horus, who, I can't, don't know how, many de how much details you can see, but Horus is depicted holding snakes and scorpions and other dangerous animals in his hands, um, which he would have found in the marshes of the Nile Delta, and he in had inherited magic power from his mother Isis, so he was able to, to conquer or, or vanquish these uh, animals. And so by representing him, that stone would possess some magic powers that would then be absorbed by the water that would flow over it, and the water was um, gathering in the basin, and then believers would drink from the water to either heal or protect themselves. And the basin, which is made in a different stone, um, it's hard to see, but has 
many layers upon layers of calcium deposits. So clearly this object had been used over centuries. Um, I believe it. So that's Horus the child and Horus the falcon. Um, now we come to the Ptolemaic period, which started with Alexander the Great, and here you have a few, um, well, it shows the, all the land that he had conquered around the Mediterranean. Of course, Alexander the Great went further um, east into Pakistan and Afghanistan, but um, he traveled to Egypt, and in fact, it was after his death um, that his follower, Ptolemy I, would create the city of Alexandria in his honor. That would then become the capital of Egypt. And I have mentioned before, here you have the kind of reincarnation, the word is not uh, well chosen, but kind of the reinterpretation of Osiris under the, by the Greek as Serapis, who of course has a completely different um, look than the classical Osiris, uh, with, the, with the beard, the moustache, the curly hair, and then the, the draping of the tunic. And this sculpture is in wood, in sycamore, sycamore wood, which is, uh, the, was the tree of life for the ancient Egyptians and often connected with Osiris as a, or with the rebirth of Osiris. And then, uh, on, and this is from around the second, third century BCE, found in a temple, inland. <coughs> but the cult of Osiris slash Serapis continued many centuries. And so, on the left, you have a bust showing the same god, um, but carved by a Roman <coughs> artist. And so, uh, even uh, during the Roman period, after the Greek. There were temples dedicated to Osiris Serapis, or Serapis Osiris. On the head, um, the god is, is uh, carrying a, a kalatos, which is the measurement for grain. So again, pointing to fertility, uh, agriculture, and abundance. Um, Osiris was also represented as a bull, the Apis bull, and uh, this particular more than life-size bull, which is also in the exhibition, a beautiful example of um, uh, a Roman sculpture, was offered by the Roman Emperor Hadrian to the temple of Serapis in, um, in, in Alexandria in the second century CE. So the Romans continued um, that a particular tradition. And the interesting thing is that um, archaeologists found the foundation plaque of that temple in Alexandria, which was founded by the Ptolemies, so we are back to the Greek period, uh, 3rd century BCE. And as you know, uh, under the Greek rule, many inscriptions were written both in hieroglyphs and in, and in Greek, sometimes even in demotic. Uh, language. So that's how, of course, hieroglyphs uh, were deciphered with the Rosetta stone that was in three languages. Um, and the fascinating thing here is that the Greek text mentions uh, the son of Serapis and Isis, and the uh, Egyptian translation is the son of Osiris, Apis, and Isis. So really making this connection between Serapis and Osiris, Apis. Now, um, the last part of um, my talk will focus on one of the most secret ceremonies that was perpetuated for uh, thousands of years in ancient Egypt, the uh, mysteries of Osiris. And you must realize that um, temples some of which had carvings on the walls detailing all kinds of uh, ceremonial um, information. Temples were not uh, open to the public in ancient Egypt. Only uh, the initiated priests could go in. Um, 
and of course the ruling uh, pharaohs, and also the papyrus, papyri that were written and that would also mention these secret ceremonies would not be would not have been available to uh, the common man and woman. So these were very uh, essential ceremonies that kind of perpetuated the dynasty and the order of the universe, uh, but they were unknown to to the common man or women, woman in ancient Egypt. And one of the reasons, uh, I think, is that these, the Osirian mysteries told the story about the death of one of the main gods. Osiris had been murdered, so that's quite um, difficult to grasp that a, a god can be killed. Um, and then he was resuscitated, and the Osirian mysteries, in fact, which were celebrated every year, would reenact and celebrate this death and rebirth. So here we have the oldest sculpture in the exhibition, which um, was found inland in a tomb, and which dates from the Middle Kingdom, 18th century BCE. And it, it shows Osiris lying on, it's not a funeral bed, because he just was resuscitated. Um, and on top of him is a bird that has lost its head, but it's a kite. And that kite represents Isis. And this is the moment of the, the conception of Horus. So after his rebirth, Osiris impregnates Isis in the shape of a kite. Um, but Horus, the falcon, is already present. You see four falcons on either side of Osiris. So it's kind of the son who watches over his parents who conceive him, of him. It's the eternal cycle of life, death, rebirth that is represented in this remarkable sculpture. Um, and I mentioned papyra. So some of these mysteries of Osiris uh, had been written down, but again, not uh, accessible to, uh, to everyone. And I, I want to focus on this representation of uh, Osiris in particular. He's lying uh, on, on his back, and then there are little things coming out of his body. And I will say more about that in a minute. So for instance, here is a drawing um, after a, a low relief on a wall temple in the temple complex of Dendera, which is in the center of Egypt. Um, and it shows um, Osiris lying on his uh, stomach. And in the exhibition, there's a, a beautiful, not very large sculpture of Osiris in that position, the awakened Osiris, who is um, carrying a beautiful, well, first he has a beautiful smile on his face, happy to be reborn. And uh, he wears a, a particular crown called the Cheni crown um, that represents rebirth. And it's um, made of electrum. Does anyone know what electrum is? So, by... Pardon me? Gold and silver. Yes, exactly. So, by studying ancient Egypt, I also learned something about chemistry. It's um, indeed the, the mixture of gold and silver. And so the crown or the horns of the ram that you see horizontally are made of electrum. And then the feathers of the ostrich, two of them, uh, combine uh, electrum and gold. And then there's the solar disk also. Uh, uh, wonderful. Um, addition to this sculpture. So, um, what happened during these uh, mysteries of Osiris? They would be celebrated every year, I said, during the month of Koyak. Um, and in fact, we are now currently in the middle of the month of Koyak. Uh, that would, would correspond to, in our calendar, mid-November through mid-December. And at the beginning of the month of Koyak, the Nile would be at its peak. And then throughout Koyak, the Nile would recede, leaving behind uh, fertile soil. 
And so it's no, no coincidence that that's the time when the Osirian Mysteries would be celebrated, which consisted basically of two parts. One was the making of two small statues of Osiris, and the second part was a nautical procession of uh, Osiris statues from one city to another city, from one temple to another temple. So here we have what happened during the making of uh, those Osiris statues. And one of them, called a corn mummy, in fact it wasn't using corn, but priests would make uh, one statue in two halves using soil of the Nile and water of the Nile and a mixture of seeds, mainly barley seeds. And he would put these two halves in what looks like a sarcophagus, but it really is a garden tank, which was found on the water, but would have been inside the temple. Um, and for a number of days, the priests would water these two halves. And the result, of course, was that the seeds would start to germinate, which uh, is kind of symbolized in this papyrus. And then, and which is a symbol for the well, rebirth of Osiris, the two halves would be put together, wrapped into uh, a mummy, and that's what you see on the left, the, the Osiris vegetans, how he was called, would be put in a small sarcophagus with the head of a falcon. And then the second, um, um, the second Osiris statuette, and there's, it has never been found, so we don't have an example of it, would be made using precious stones that would be grind, uh, ground in a mortar, mixed with um, all kinds of secret ingredients and incense and other um, silver and gold, other valuable materials. Again, two halves would be put together, made into a mummy, and that represented the celestial aspect of Osiris. This clearly was the, his vegetal or earthly um, side. And so those two statues of Osiris, at the end of the month of Koyak, the, a priest, towards the end, a priest would put them, an Osirian priest, would put them in a sacred and secret tomb inside the temple. And as this was done each and every year, of course, there would be the two statues of Osiris from the previous year. And so they had to be taken out and they were then uh, taken uh, in, in a procession that was also done in secret from one temple to the next. Um, and the archaeologists have discovered the sacred channel that connected the temple, the Amun temple in Thonis Heracleon, to the Osiris temple in Canopus. On the water they discovered a, a, a channel, and on the bottom of a channel, of that channel they found one shipwreck that had been used in this nautical procession, which they didn't excavate, so they left it on the bottom of the sea because um, it would have uh, disintegrated if they had tried to lift it out of the clay. But they did excavations around that shipwreck that had been used in this uh, procession, and they found the, the, all kinds of s little statues of Osiris and also um, leaden votive boats that had been thrown into the water by priests. And I must immediately say that this picture on the left, of course, is, uh, is completely staged. Um, in fact, uh, Frank Godio explained to me that for most of the time it's impossible to see further than one foot under the sea in the bay of Abukir Bay. Uh, in, the, in the water of Abu Kebe because of pollution. And once in a while there would be enough visibility and the pho photographer from the ship would be called down and would make wonderful photos, but that was uh, more exceptional. So that's the photo that you see. But all these, uh, also the objects of course would have had all kinds of in, uh, 
additions and, and crustaceans and had to be cleaned. So they would be brought back down in, um, underwater to be photographed. And so um, around this shipwreck and along the channel, they discovered hundreds of ritual ladles, uh, offering dishes, even a libation bowl in gold. And they were all used during these Osirian mysteries. Um, which, as I mentioned, were extremely secret. They, they were only de deciphered when the hieroglyphs could be read towards the end of the or early 19th century, late 18th century. And so, in, underwater, they also discovered <coughs> the head of a larger sculpture that represents uh, an Assyrian priest. And um, there are quotes that the priests make, for instance, on the walls of one of the temples, uh, the priest would say, I'm a priest instructed in the mystery whose chest does not release what he has seen. And you see the very tight lips of the, of the priest, uh, the shaven head also, a sign of purity. And um, indeed, the priests would not even mention the name Osiris. They would talk about the God whose name I cannot say. And it was all in this very secretive language that they would um, explain what they were doing. But so the purpose, again, of this important ritual that was done for thousands of years, every year, in a number of temples in uh, ancient Egypt, the purpose was to, as I said, celebrate the death but then rebirth of Osiris and to guarantee the continuation of the dynasty because uh, pharaohs were also in, uh, initiated into these Assyrian mysteries and um, it would also kind of herald the return of fertility to Egypt uh, since it was done at the onset of the new agricultural cycle. Um, the, the Nile had receded and farmers could plant their seeds. So to end, um, he, there are two more uh, objects that I would like to show. This is um, yet another representation of Osiris, which is typical for the northern, for these cities that have now disappeared, for Canopus and Thonis Heracleon, especially Canopus. And in fact, it is called Osiris Canopus. Osiris is represented as a jar, but it's not really a vessel, it's a, um, a stone, it's, it's, it's not hollow on the inside. It's a carved stone, um, but the idea is that the body of Osiris is made, or his humors are connected to the water of the Nile. That's how he's able to, to um, resuscitate the Nile also each year. And so, um, the interesting thing is that this representation of Osiris as a jar, uh, in the shape of a jar, was known for the literature, but had never been really discovered. And so, um, with the excavations in Canopus, uh, it was found. And I'm not an Egyptologist, but um, I do know that there is something called the Canopic vessel, but that's not the same thing. That's a real vessel that was used in, by ancient Egyptians to um, to preserve the uh, organs of a mummy. So that's called a canopic jar, but that's not the same thing as the Osiris canopus, which was not hollow. And on the right, there is um, a priest holding such a Osiris canopus. It's such a sacred object that he uses his sleeves to not touch uh, the god, the uh, representation of the god. And this particular um, figure of a priest was found in a temple dedicated to Osiris, not in uh, Thonis Heracleon and not in Canopus, but in Alexandria. So Alexandria is a, is a big city today, it's the lar second largest city after Cairo, but parts of Alexandria had also been uh, flooded and, and had been swallowed by the sea. So underwater archaeologists have um, done excavations in the ancient port 
of Alexandria, discovered, made discoveries there, and the palace of the last pharaoh of the Ptolemaic dynasty was discovered in Alexandria. And of course, that's Cleopatra, who was at large, the last Ptolemy and who committed suicide in, in the 30s BCE. And, and then the Romans took over, and the Romans turned Egypt into a, a province, a Roman province. They, it was a different form of colonization compared to the Greek. But um, Cleopatra had a temple in her, near her palace dedicated to Osiris, and that's where this particular priest was discovered. And in fact, he was discovered flanked in the same site they found two uh, sphinxes that uh, flanked him, and a sphinx combines the body of a lion with the head of a pharaoh, and one of those two sphinxes could be identified, or the head could be identified with uh, Cleopatra's father, who was one of the Ptolemies. And so the interesting thing is that a wall painting discovered in Herculaneum, which is near um, Pompeii, has a representation of this kind of priest that you can see here, who is holding a Osiris Canopus, and on the painting one can even see that the priest uses his tunic to hold it. And, and then there are two attendants, holding sistrums, which are rattles, and then you have these two sphinxes. So, um, which was exactly what the underwater archaeologists found in, in Alexandria, and which is in the exhibition. I'm sorry that I don't have a picture of all three, the priest with the two sphinxes. And so the question is, does this painting, hundreds of miles away from, uh, from Alexandria, does it represent the temple in Alexandria, or would there have been Osirian temples using the same scenography in Italy during the Roman period? Um, that, that's, that answer hasn't been, that question hasn't been answered yet, but it's still, either way, it shows how Egyptian culture, uh, religion, and art would uh, have traveled all around the Mediterranean, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and even influenced uh, artists in Italy during the Roman period. That's the end of my lecture. Thank you. We have some time for a few questions. Yes, definitely. Uh, Jan Ludwig, who owns these objects? What does the Egyptian government get? What does Frank Gaudio get from his diving and discoveries? Uh, thank you for asking that question because next week I'll be talking about question, issues of ownership of uh, cultural heritage in Africa. And so, of course, Egypt has the oldest laws uh, from any African country to protect its uh, archaeological heritage. And all the objects that the underwater archaeologists discover belong to the Egyptian government and go to Egyptian museums. And all the objects in this exhibition come from Egyptian museums, from the smallest jewelry to these large uh, colossi. And, um, Frank Godio and his team um, of underwater archaeologists are, have been supported by a, a private foundation for the last 20 years uh, called Hilti, which is a producer of uh, tools, um, which also exists in the US, Hilti, and, but they are based in Liechtenstein, and so they also, it's still uh, privately owned, it's a family, the Hilti family, and so they have so much money that they can use uh, some of it for uh, philanthropic use, including um, supporting this kind of research. Yes, that's why I think there, if, if we go back 
all the way here, um, I think the opening page mentions, should mention somewhere Hilti. I hope. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's, um, th there, there is of course a problem with looting in Egypt um, and of illegal excava uh, excavations and so this exhibition is completely kosher in that respect. Oh, I was just curious, you, you don't mention the issue of whether the sea level has changed because you talk about things going to, but it wasn't in fact, hasn't sea level actually risen and that's part of the issue all the way around or am I mistaken? Uh, the whole Mediterranean actually, there's a lot of stuff underwater so I'm wondering. Yeah, to, I, I don't know the answer to that question around the, the, the coast of the Mediterranean. But things have changed in the Nile Delta, mainly um, after the building of the Aswan Dam, which is not shown here, which um, regulates the, the, f the flow of the Nile, obviously, and so the Nile Delta has become much drier now, on the contrary, so not wetter, but drier. And so a number of these branches of the Nile that you see now, especially the Canopic branch, which is kind of the second of the left, which uh, is between Alexandria and Rosetta, the branch of the city of Canopus, which was the most important branch of the Nile uh, during that particular period. Um, that branch no longer exists. It it's, has been dried out because there's less water flooding the Nile Delta due to the Aswan Dam. But more, more, uh, while, more widely, to, uh, to your question about r rising sea levels of the Mediterranean, I, I don't know enough about that. Yes. We can always ask Trump. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I had a question with regards to you. You mentioned that the original name of, of Egypt was was obviously the the dark soil comet or whatever, and then the that Egypt actually comes from 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 Greek. W what does the word actually mean, Egypt? <sighs> <laughs> Do you I, know? I, I, mean, I no. once knew it. It's um, it's related to the word Copt, uh, like in the Coptic Church. Egypt and Copt have the same root, and I forgot what it uh, what it is. So Google will have the answer. But uh, <laughs> um, does anybody else have a question? One that I can answer, <laughs> please. Sorry, can you pass? Um, uh, how uh, how readable and how many people can read all those ancient inscriptions? I don't mean just in the delta, but generally of the of the the writings and symbolic stuff from ancient Egypt. You mean back then? No, oh. now. I mean, can, are there a lot of people that can read those things now? And and are, are they are they are they, have, people they have who been... can read everything, so to speak? Yes, I, I think there are, yes, and things have been translated, so they are available now in, in modern languages. Is your question whether there are some texts that have not yet been deciphered? Yes. Not to my knowledge. Certainly not ancient Egyptian. Yeah. I, I do, I have an answer to a question that nobody asks. Um, so. The, the, the brother of Osiris, who's called Seth, in fact, his name is, um, has the same root as our word Satan. It comes from there. So he was really a bad boy. <laughs> when did they start with this mystery? How long, how old? So the question is, how old are the mysteries of Osiris? And um, my understanding is that, uh, well, the, I know that the couple, Isis and Osiris, belong to the very oldest layers of the Egyptian pantheon. And my understanding is that the mysteries started early on, in, probably in the fourth millennium, around 
300 BCE. Yeah. And, and they would be celebrated throughout the Egyptian kingdom, not just in the north, obviously. Yes. Um, I wanted to first thank you for your lecture. Um, it was really great. Um, I had a question. This seems like an unusual environment to discover such objects, right? And so I was wondering about the degree of restoration um, these objects might have um, had uh, once they were excavated from the water. Thanks. Thank you for that question. So first I should say that um, many of these implements of the Osirian mysteries have never been discovered on land for the simple reason, of course, that uh, they were available to looters in, in all the 2,000 years after the end, or, or about 2,000 years after the end of the Egyptian kingdom. And so the bronze of the ladles would have been recast, the gold would be reused, etc. And so the fact that they were underwater and inaccessible kind of ha has protected them for a long time. Now, um, to the best of my knowledge, no wooden sculptures have been... That's not true. They have discovered some small wooden sculptures under the sea that were preserved because they were embedded in clay. Um, then I know that these uh, leaden boats had to be restored in the sense that they had, been, that they had completely curled up. And so a, a conservator would carefully try to flatten them. Um, many of the objects, both in stone and in metal, had been covered by um, material from animals or plants, and so had to be cleaned. I don't think that there was that much actual repair necessary, except, for instance, for the uh, large colossi that had fallen down and broken in many pieces, or seven pieces, or eight pieces, so... Um, I don't know if that addresses your question. Oh, one more. Yeah, Ludwig, are there many more objects, and then these are just a selected few? And then also, are the, um, is the archaeological dig ongoing? Right. Yes. In fact, um, and I was kind of surprised, but Frank Godio explained that less than 10% has been excavated so far. So um, if, if you come back in 50 years, I will give a different lecture <laughs> altogether, because the, the excavations continue. He goes back at least once a year. Uh, usually during the summer, and um, and so new discoveries are being made. And so he may, of course, he made it. There are thousands of objects that they excavated, and also they left a lot on the bottom of the sea. For instance, um, at the beginning, I showed these uh, uh, columns and stones, and there are whole pavements of streets that that remain on the water, but. Um, for this exhibition, a selection was made of about 250 objects that came from underwater, of the couple of thousands that were discovered and that are in Egyptian museums, in Alexandria, in fact, uh, and then plus these other 30, 40 objects from inland museums. Um, but yes, they expect still to find a lot. One of the things that is still a little unclear is, so they found these temples and all these things related to ritual and religion, they have found very few uh, or no uh, living quarters. So these, these were populated cities, both Canopus and Thonis Heracleon. So where, where did the ordinary people live? How did they live? And are there any uh, daily use articles that will come up? Yes. <laughs> 
I have a loud voice, I can just shout. Um, I, about probably eight years ago, the California Science Museum, the California Science Museum down by USC had a exhibition, and I think it focused only on the uh, underwater archaeology of Alexandria. And uh, there were some objects and mostly films, but it was the same thing, that it was very partial. You got the impression that there was a whole city under there that Julius Caesar and Cleopatra and Mark Antony all lived in, and none of that is actually above water. So their entire city must be down there. I got that impression, and there's supposedly a museum in Alexandria that of that exhibi uh, excavation. Of those excavations, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, um, one of the dreams of uh, Frank Godio and his Egyptian counterparts is to create a museum underwater in the Bay of Alexandria, not in uh, Canopus or Heraklion, which are too far off the coast, but uh, that would be accessible from, uh, from the city of Alexandria and that would show what's still underwater there, yes. But that's kind of a futuristic dream. I don't know if I'm on the wrong track, but you intimated that there was a different kind of relationship between Greece, uh, Greece and Egypt and, and then later with the Romans, that it was some qualitatively different type of interaction. Yes, so, um, well, first of all, we think uh, today of Africa as a continent that um, um, is in, in dire straits, that needs help, that cannot survive without donations from the West, etc. And kind of the, the Afro-pessimistic um, discourse. But it's good to remember that um, during centuries, I mean from around probably 800 BCE till the first century com of the Common Era, Egypt was the bread, the bread basket of the Mediterranean and produced enormous surpluses of food. That's why the Greek to begin with and then the Romans were interested in Egypt because there was so much food that they could feed their, their military with it. So, and um, to, I must confess that I, I haven't really studied the issue deep enough, but I have a sense that the, it, that the Greek were much more interested in integrating their culture with the Egyptian culture, um, although that continued to a certain degree under the Romans, but that the, the Greek had also um, a, a lot of respect for the Egyptian civilization. I mean, uh, if one reads Plato, which also predates the Ptolemies, uh, Plato writes about um, an Egyptian philosopher who came before him called Solon. And Solon visited Egypt and was probably initiated into the mysteries. And, and uh, so there was a whole tradition in Greece of studying Egypt. And then, and then there was the military and political conquest. Uh, I think that that aspect somewhat um, was less important to the Romans, yes. So. I think you said at the outset that these excavations are occurring in uh, Aboukir Bay, uh, which I think was the site of a famous battle between Napoleon's fleet, which was destroyed by the British when he invaded uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, I'll bet, and maybe you know, are there a whole other set of archaeologists? Is it pretty crowded underwater? There are another set <laughs> of archaeologists is searching for remains of the of the French fleet. Um, and not that I know of. I haven't heard of that. No. Good. It's a good project for you to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Curious about the release of these objects to uh, and getting it the exhibit at the Minneapolis Institute of Art and how that worked. I mean, some of these objects are enormous and extremely heavy. And how does the Egyptian government look at this? And is the exhibit going to other museums? Right. So um, that's also a good question. So the French 
curators work with the Egyptian government and um, it's a very complicated contract that fortunately no other venues have to deal with and it's a package and so as I mentioned it traveled through Europe of course the Brits always have to do it differently and when it came to the British Museum the British Museum added some of their own collection which the Egyptians weren't too happy about I, I learned um, and so and then indeed it traveled to the US uh, and it, all these heavy objects came by plane by freighter cargo yeah and uh, so they it started out in St. Louis and in fact Minneapolis worked together with St. Louis to build the, the casework uh, which uh, is, is really beautiful um, I saw only one other venue in Europe in, in Zurich Ried, the Riedberg Museum and um, I can say that the exhibitions have vastly improved in, in the US um, and so the Egyptians don't want to lend this for short periods that's why the exhibition normally Mia and also St. Louis do exhibitions for three months, but this has a six month run. And there's always at least one Egyptian courier present during the exhibition. The installation of the cases is done by French and Egyptians. So the local museum crew um, hardly touches the art. I mean, sometimes it's impossible to avoid that, with, especially with the large and heavy objects. But so it's really, um, and so I meant to say that the closed cases, some of course sculptures are out in the open on platforms, but the closed vitrines uh, have seals that are checked by the Egyptian courier and so on and so forth. So they, they keep control and then rightly so over their heritage and that's how, how they work together. And so, um, ideally, the, the organizers of the show would find another venue in the US or Canada because this whole package is now here. And if not, then everything will be shipped back literally from Minneapolis to Egypt. And so go back so to before you even ask that question, we don't have enough temporary exhibition <laughs> space. Although it looks like it would be a fabulous, fabulous thing. Um, I just have one last question for you. I think we've already uh, worn you out by now and sent so much incredible material. But um, as in the case of some previous lectures, um, they seem to be working on um, excavations that have been ongoing for uh, sometimes decades. And so I just wondered if you happen to know from an art historical standpoint if anything has been discovered that has disturbed conventional wisdom art historically about this period um, or if it's all consistent with what had already been believed? Yes, um, I, I would say yes to that question. It confirms what what has been what had been known before but as I as I mentioned for instance the discovery that Thonis and Heraklion are one in the same city is new. Um, all these ritual paraphernalia used in the mysteries is also somewhat new. Uh, they had been described and uh, gathered from texts and, and depictions on temple walls, but this high concentration is, is unique. Uh, and again, because uh, it had been um, protected by the water, that's why. And is there a way, from the point of view of sitting planning, do you think virtually at least to recreate the disposition of the various temples? I wonder just how much evidence is offered to at least give a better comprehensive understanding of how the cities were organized. Well, I don't have that picture here, but there is an artistic rendering of Thonis Heraklion with the temples and the, the water. I mean, this was really a bit like Venice. It, it was a city built on islands. In, in the delta of one of the branches of the Nile. And so um, this is, a, we blew up that photograph and it's larger than that wall, or half that wall. Um, and it, it's at the opening of the exhibition, at the entrance of the exhibition, and it gives an artistic rendering. But we, I mean, the ar archeologists still don't know enough to really reconstruct the city. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I want to remind people that um, Jan Ludovic will be back with us next week, and he'll be speaking about um, his field, uh, African art, and I hope you'll join us for that lecture as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.